in a world where most people watch movies and then forget about them. These brave heroes join forces to watch them again and then talk about them. Join them in their epic journey as they go back in time, a decade and beyond, to revisit and break down films from a vast array of genres. Do these movies hold up over time? Are they classics? Find out on Retro Movie Roundtable. Starring your hosts, Brian Fry, Chad Robinson, Destin Melbarnes, Nathan Lutz, and Russell Guest. Coming now to Headphones in Your Ears. Welcome all you lords, ladies, and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable, the podcast where we watch movies and then talk about them. I'm your host, Chad Robinson, and joining me today is my good friend and co-host, Dustin Melbardis. Dustin, how are you this evening? I'm great. Good evening, Chad. I'm, I'm very good. I have had um, a busy day, and I get to sit down and just chill with my buds talking about movies. Absolutely. And you know what, Dustin? Tonight is a good night. We have a returning guest her heart will go on. We are bringing back from the Titanic episode, Lizzie Haynes. Lizzie, thank you for coming back. Thank you for talking to us. Hi, thank you guys so much for having me. I'm happy to be back. Oh, we're so excited. And we're going to do our warm-up questions. We're going to talk about some uh, horror movies today, which is why I'm here, because the word horror, it's like Beetlejuice. You say it three times, I show up. I am so excited. I am pumped for this. <laughs> Lizzie, we will start with you. What is something that consistently scares you in a horror movie? And I understand you like horror movies. So this could be tough. Yes, I am a huge horror movie person. It's my ultimate favorite genre. Anyone that knows me knows that I love to be scared. But I think what consistently scares me is any movie that has a really good lore. So I think if you can establish that there's some kind of haunted story within the movie itself and then the movie unwinds with that lore kind of coming to fruition to me those are the ones that i find the scariest like a good example of that would be candy man mm, not the new one right when i was a kid that scared me so badly <laughs> like absolutely horrified me i'm not gonna lie i actually really did enjoy the jordan peele remake of that for sure okay well i'll let that one go that one didn't work yeah! for me but <laughs> The original, yes. Uh, when yes. you're, it's the modified Bloody Mary game and the bravest kids. Only the bravest ones were saying Candyman. Exactly. Yes, I copped out after about three. I couldn't make it to the five. I still can't. Even if you if you told me to go into the bathroom now, I never. Not a never in chance. <laughs> <laughs> Dustin, what scares you? Well, that's a different question. Uh, I think what the original <laughs> question is what consistently scares you in a horror movie. Yes. Because um, I, 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 in response, I do want to say, like, I'm totally like a Bloody Mary, Candyman, uh, the, the lore, the idea that it could be real. I am the one that does the dare. I am the one that, like, sneaks through the bars of the cemetery. I am the one that draws the pentagram, right? I, 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 oh, no, I like no. pushing. I like I like being the one in real life to push this stuff, and I think part of my head is always like, well, if I get killed by a ghost, then at least I got to like confirm that ghosts are real first before I'm here, before I'm yanked away and gone. But as far as movies go, uh, this uh, it was hard for me originally to to think because I think the number one thing is it maybe sounds like an unfair answer is like jump scares. I like movies with jump scares. Oh, I, I I think. I think they're fun. I, it's part of the fun for me. I'm definitely not on the side of I hate jump scares. But if we're going to go with something more subtle, we actually do get a little bit of this in what we're covering tonight. It's whenever there's video or CCTV or some type of camera that time is moving extremely fast. Let's say you have a clock on the wall where the, you know, the, the hands are spinning mm. and someone is stationary. But you can tell they're not stationary. They're like fidgeting, you know, like standing still for like a full 24 hours. They're just kind of fidgeting. That kind of camera trick is something that unsettles me. Among all the other things I could think about, that's that's one of my big ones. Okay. All right. I, I like that. I like that motif in movies, that trope. For me, I, I'm 
like Lizzie, I think I've almost crossed the 1,100 unique horror movies. So I've seen a Jeez. lot of them. But <laughs> what frightens me or, or consistently unsells me is sort of in the same vein as what you're saying, Dustin. It's movies where I really have to pay attention and things are happening in the background and they're subtle. They have these still shots. So the paranormal activities, host, even some of Blair Witch where... You just have the focus on one area, but things are happening and you know they should be happening in the background. That tenses me up because it, it forces you to pay attention. And so that gets me. Lizzie, what's the last movie you saw? The last movie I saw, my husband and I saw The Gray Man on Netflix. I've heard good it's things. The, it was actually really good. It was... Honestly, I mean, the best way to describe it without sounding too rude, it's a kind of a B version of 007, but it was a really fun watch. To me, action can only be done one way. It has to be fun. If it takes itself too seriously, I'm out. And so that they did a really great job of just making it a fun 90-minute watch with Ryan Gosling and Billy Bob Thornton. Uh, Chris Evans, I mean, the cast was pretty stacked. It was good. Yeah, that's a great cast. Dustin, what movie did you see last? Uh, it kind of falls into the same vein, though I haven't seen The Gray Man. I know the ads for it. Uh, I just recently watched, it was a rewatch of uh, The Man from Uncle, okay. the one that came out just uh, seven, eight years ago, I think, something around then. Uh, but the, like that kind of humor is my thing. Um, I think we still tolerated Army Hammer at that point, and I like <laughs> him in that movie. I like him in that movie. Uh, and th th I think the the humor. The, a buddy of mine said, "Like, are you a fan of that movie?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, let's watch it." So uh, you know, we're we're we have the same type of sense of humor, and I, I can rewatch stuff like that over and over because older movies like that have, share that humor too. So um, it it just it hits me right in the right spot. That's awesome. And I watched The Blackwoods, which is like a Western James Bond movie. I, I'm kidding. It's a it's a horror movie. Surprise, surprise. Surprise, it a, surprise. It is a Western horror movie, sort of in the same vein as Bone Tom Tomahawk, far less bloody. Uh, it's worth checking out. It's a brand new film this year, but you can tell it's a little bit low budget. There's some costuming and audio issues. I won't go into too much of the spoilers. But I, I enjoy it. I like when we mix in Native American lore. There aren't enough Wendigo movies, so I need more Wendigo movies. And this fits the mold. So check out The Black Woods. Does it take place in North America, the movie? Yes, it absolutely does. Is it in the States or is it in Canada? Because I think of Canada first when I think of the Wendigo. South Dakota. All right, it's up there. <laughs> <laughs> Close to Canada, not quite. Far from me. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Dustin, though, we, we've beaten around the bush. We are doing a horror movie. Can you introduce what horror movie we are doing today? Uh, tonight we cover, from 2002, The Ring. That's right. The Ring, starring Naomi Watts, Martin Henderson, David Dorfman, Jane Alexander, and Brian Cox. Released in 2002, it's got a budget of $48 million dollars. It grosses $129 million domestically. It was the biggest worldwide gross of a horror remake until Steve, Stephen King's It in 2017, so this is a big deal. It puts it at number 18 in the box office. This is places behind Minority Report, great movie, and it places just ahead of Sweet Home Alabama, less great movie. The number <laughs> one movie that year was Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, which is a great movie that Brian Fry will just rage at all day. We will probably never cover it. IMDb gives this a 7.1. Critics give this a 71%. And I have to imagine this audience score is getting, just attacking it recently because I don't know anyone that feels this. 48%. Unbelievable. I, I'm shocked at that because it's just not the experience I had growing up. Awards. Dustin, we finally get an award-winning movie. We, <laughs> we get Saturn Awards, which are horror awards. It wins two for Best Movie Horror and Best Actress. It wins the very prestigious MTV Movie Awards for Best Villain 
for Samara Morgan and a Teen Choice Awards winner for Best Horror Movie. So we have very prestigious awards right here. I do think the Saturn Awards for a horror movie is good. Everything else, you know, it's just been a running Very game. much prestigious, yes. I, I do have to say, if our number one movie was Spider-Man and, our, and The Ring came in at 17... Uh, but still took home best villain. That means that Samara is a greater villain than the Green Goblin, objectively, right? Bummer for Willem Dafoe, I yeah. guess. You know, I consider myself <laughs> something of an Onrio. <laughs> an on- thats the type of ghost, right? <laughs> yes, yes, type of spirit. Oh, great. You guys know names of ghosts. I'm going to find myself lacking in info. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is this is my nerdy wheelhouse. So, Lizzie. You picked this movie, you shortlisted this movie, and as I mentioned before, the hosts were just clamoring to get on to this this podcast. There was a fight. Dustin and I emerged victorious. Had you seen The Ring before? And if you did? Oh, yeah. Okay, you'd seen it. What did you think of it when you first saw it? When did you last see it? And do you still like it? Does it still hold up for you? So I will never forget why uh, or when I first saw this movie, the reason why this movie sticks with me is because of the powerful impact it had. The first time I saw it, I was 14 and freshman in high school. I was with all of my show choir friends. We were over at a friend's house watching the VHS or DVD. I can't quite remember which was which. And I it was the first time I really remember being truly petrified. (laughs) I had seen, I had seen scary movies before. Like I remember seeing the exorcist, like my older brother had me watch that. But when you're watching a movie in 2002 and you're too young to appreciate the cinematography and the imagination that's required, you watch a movie like that and it feels campy. So I never really felt afraid before in that way. So for me, And without going into too many details of the movie, just the ending in particular, I remember my mom, being 14, I could not drive yet. So my mom's friend picked us up, took us home. It just so happened that my parents were out of town. And I remember sitting in the driveway, hysterically crying. (laughs) I didn't want to go inside by myself. And I sat in my friend, in my driveway, my friend's car crying to her mom being can I please please spend the night with you Mm -hmm. (laughs) she she was very gracious and allowed me to um so I'll never forget that that's like a core memory for me I mean if if uh inside out was really a thing there's somewhere there would be like a ringland of like what made me first fall in love with the scary movies and that memory last time I saw it I had some of my girlfriends over to watch it to kind of recreate that moment all over again. And it was, it did not disappoint. I mean, honestly, watching it now as 33 year old, it, it felt a little bit more like a creepypasta more so than something that was genuinely terrifying, but regardless, it was so much fun. And I really, really appreciate how well they did that storytelling. And it's just a good time. That is a fantastic story i i love when scary movies make people cry that is yes. <laughs> pretty, Lots of tears, but nice. that is fantastic dustin when did you first cry upon seeing the ring who boy now i do uh cry with sad music but i've never been a like scared into tears i guess <laughs> i should say this came after I would say my introduction to being terrified was the Blair Witch Project, uh, which I believe I've told you before is I watched it a midnight showing, which means at 2.15 a.m. I walked through the forest to get back home <laughs> Wow! because I'm from Tennessee <laughs> and I lived on the side of a mountain. Um, so that that was my introduction to terror. But I think what what Lizzie just said about rewatching this movie nowadays you, you said kind of feels like a creepy pasta. You could say the entire genre of online short horror fiction, no matter which way you go, creepy pasta or like the, the there, there's a couple other um, internet sources of like you know you read scary stories that type of thing could be could be based on like the introduction to American cinema, which would have to be The Ring, I think. So it, it was stuff like this that made that popular. Uh, for me, I saw this in theaters, super excited to see it. 
uh, and super excited to come back for it uh, because I, I was definitely one of the guys who, like, in the locker room is when I would hear about what did you see? Did you see a movie? I didn't live in the city, so other people had easier access to go and, like, check out a brand new movie, and it's only if I heard it was good. And it was one of those things where people were talking about it and almost with a shudder or almost with, like, a – like maybe I, maybe you shouldn't watch it. Like, like that's how scary it is. Right. Uh, but I was, I was excited. And probably the only other, like – now, I didn't know it was a remake at the time when I was a boy – but um, the only other movie that was ever like the same level of hype that I wanted to go see was the uh, Jessica Biel driven Texas Chainsaw Massacre, ah. um, which was also a remake. But like th- th- I get excited for certain movies, you know, the Paranormal Activity, Insidious, like certain things that come out that, that there's there is a certain feeling of excited to see. But, yeah, I saw it as a boy and it's now on like a regular uh, rotation for Halloween movies, uh, The Ring. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Hellraiser, um, and Elf. Elf. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not Elf. I just wanted to add a fourth thing to the list. <laughs> it is horrifying how he eats his spaghetti, so I will give you that. Mm, yeah. But yeah, I I did just rewatch the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and man, that movie is brutal and still holds up for. It's surprisingly not gory for a movie with the word massacre in it. It pulls away, but man, man, that's still 70s grit. Just nothing, nothing like it. For me, I'm the same. I saw this in theater. It may have been opening night, and I saw it with our co-host, Brian Fry, and what was his girlfriend at the time, now a wife. Uh, And I remember everyone we went with being scared. I'll never forget the scream from Ooh. Katie's death in this movie. Yeah. Uh, when they show her face, I, that's just one of those things that's burned in my mind, the theater screaming at that scene. And what I did, because I was internet savvy, is I spoofed my AIM instant messenger so I could appear online while simultaneously I had created an account of Samara Morgan. And I messaged all my friends that had seen this movie with me, reminding them that they had seven days to live. And they all got freaked out. And I could, I had plausible deniability because I was online. It couldn't possibly be someone else. It had to be someone else. Uh, so, yes, that was who I was. I last saw it, I, I don't know, probably a year ago. This is kind of a regular rotation for me as well. I I like this type of supernatural horror. I like the concept of a cursed item, whether it's a videotape or, you know, someone someone could do it online now. Cursed websites. There was a fear.com, which, by the way, was a terrible movie. It can be done so better. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, this is this is one that I revisit quite often. So it is fantastic. I've seen the original, the the Japanese Ringu, as well, and the uh, the sequels Ring Two and uh, Rings, which is they're interesting. They take a different direction, but this is this is the best of the lot. So we are going to spoil this movie for you. Dustin's going to spoil it. If you haven't seen the Ring, and check it out. Check it out before we spoil it for you. We will be back in just a few seconds, and then we'll get into our discussion. Welcome to the All 80s Movies Podcast. I'm Bill. And I'm Jason. And this is the podcast where we talk about the blockbusters, the flops, and everything in between from one of the freshest decades for movies, the 1980s. So whether you're a brain, a jock, a valley girl, or a Jedi, we've got some 80s classics for you. Do these movies stand the test of time? Are we discovering something new? Is there an 80s movie we're finally watching for the first time? Join us each week as we dive into the cinematic nostalgia that inspired and influenced a generation. From the hits to the cult classics, we'll discuss our earliest memories, favorite scenes, fun facts, and our not-so-favorite movie moments, too. It's the All 80s Movies Podcast, now available on all major streaming platforms. 
Please subscribe and happy listening. And we're back. Last warning before Dustin ruins the ring for you. Put us on pause. Go watch it. Dustin, can you break down this movie? Rachel Keller is a Seattle journalist with a young son, Aiden, who is investigating the mysterious death of her niece and her three friends, who seem to all die on the same day at the same time, 10 p.m. After being told that her niece was found in a closet with a horrifying look on her face, tell me about a 16-year-old who just dies of a heart attack, she searches through the room and finds some pictures of a cabin where her niece and her friends had stayed a week before the deaths. Rachel finds the cabin, number 12, and finds an unknown video there. She watches it, but only has a limited time to live afterwards, receiving the now infamous short phone message, Seven Days. She and Aiden's father, Noah, research about the video and find facts about Anna Morgan and her daughter, Samara Morgan, the maker of this video. Uh, with less than a week left, Rachel and Noah discover the unknown secrets of the life of Samara Morgan. Rachel deduces that the only way to break this curse is to make a copy of the video so other people can watch and forces her young son, Aiden, to do so with a wrapped up mysterious ending that people still talk about 20 years later. Mm, very, very good. Yeah, we kind of get a mystery here. So like I mentioned earlier, The Ring is based, it's based on a Japanese film called Ringu, and its success is largely responsible for kicking off a lot of these J-horror remakes that we see during the early 2000s. So we get Dark Water, we get Pulse, The Grudge with Sarah Michelle Gellar, One Miss Call, but the big one is the ring this is this is the best of all of those lots so one big change from the japanese film is that our onryo it's and an onryo is an angry vengeful woman that's she gets supernatural rage and acts out on basically anyone that she encounters so that's our samara here the onryo is a child instead of in ringu uh, Sadako is an adult woman. So I don't know if either of you have managed to check out the original Ringu, but I'm going to ask you if you like Samara being a vengeful spirit as a child, or does the thought of an adult woman, say the Sadako plot, does that is that more appealing? Is it threatening as a child? We'll start with Lizzie. I think I remember in the early 2000s, there was this whole... A genre almost of creepy children and yes. <laughs> like, you know, like even in the movie fear.com if you remember there was like a little girl in a pink dress with a bouncy ball like running around it was like even if it didn't fuel the actual plot there was always somehow for about a good five or ten years there was always creepy children involved and it felt like the ring at least for me was the start of that experience i know of course um, you know, you've got Reagan and, and things like that that happened prior, but at least for me, this was my first introduction to it. I think there is an innocence that comes with children that allows us to be vulnerable and to trust them. And so for that, in this movie, for that to be taken away and to be juxtaposed with instead to be something to be feared, I think is really interesting. And honestly, I feel is, is quite scarier than just a a woman scorned i think you hit the nail on the head with the the thing about it's 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 something that like inherently a little girl probably shouldn't be scary uh but we take a look at our horror film industry and i think uh part of some of the most successful things are taking things that aren't supposed to be scary and then they become so think about a little doll that that is yeah. only seen as scary because what our horror industry has done um <laughs> even I, I, just the shower in psycho you know right. the, yeah. sh the shower yeah <laughs> um now there are other things that are naturally scary like the dark we'll say or a monster uh, but you know i i was re-watching a clip of insidious yesterday and i i believe they the, like th there are certain things about like they they, they call the 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 demon in that the, the lipstick faced demon or something like that is taking something mundane or 
uninteresting or unscary, but you add it to mm-hmm. something terrifying, and it does. It kind of messes with your head a little bit. I, I think maybe with your initial question, Chad, the one thing I would say is about a child, and then you said the Onryo is 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 some is some type of like summoning rage or embodiment of rage. Yes, they die in such a way that their rage is projected into just sheer vengeance. Yeah, I think maybe maybe that's where uh. And this is me being nitpicky, but maybe that's where, like, do children, do they hold on to some type of base form of rage and anger that adults grow out of? Or have they had not enough experience to, you know, understand vengeance or rage really uh, on a grand scale? I think maybe that's the only that's probably what I would be looking for of a difference between the young girl rage monster ghost and the older woman (laughs) rage monster ghost. Sounds like she needs uh, Mr. Rogers. You know, what do you do with the mad that you feel? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Like his number one quote. I, you would argue that children are capable of being angry, but, uh, and I know from personal experience, yeah. my six year old <laughs> get quite angry at me. Unbridled, <laughs> I mean, in a way, just like no restrictions, no governor on the rage yet. Yes, it's like their frontal lobe is like not <laughs> their ability to reason and, and find logic is kind of gone. So, I mean, if that's true for Samara and you've got her, her, I'm not going to try to pronounce the word, but her, her vengeance spirit now kind of compounded with her non-fully developed brain i think that's the most petrifying of them all yeah i I think with children uttering lines when they the doctor is examining her and saying you don't want to hurt anyone and she just responds with oh (laughs) but i do yes very scary there's an instant difference between an adult woman where you're just like you're crazy versus a child saying that and saying oh this child's evil end it in this child you bring up the the trend i think of Bo from signs that little girl i wanted her gone it's like she's creepy she's just no child acts like this but yeah we did get the creepy children phase so i i like the creepy little girl and i think it adds to the tragedy there's something worse about killing this very desired child and just in a very brutal way throwing her down a well and then she doesn't die she's clawing at the side of the well for seven days Mm -hmm. to the point she loses her fingernails yeah the rage just yeah that that is messed up and lizzie sent me a podcast of kind of what this story is based off of uh, of a servant woman who was accused of breaking the mistress's plates and so she was killed in such a manner that she became one of these on Rio spirits where she tormented the inhabitants of, it was a castle, right? It was, uh, yes, yeah. yes. A castle. It's a haunted places podcast to plug that, but there's, uh, the, I forget what it's called, what the cab It's a real castle that yes. the, that the lore was created. And yes. Yeah. So, so this is, this is kind of based off of, at least Japanese folklore and a huge, huge part. We've talked about the Blair Witch Project. And if you weren't around for that and the viral marketing, I I can only compare it to something like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I'm not old enough for that, but Texas Chainsaw was advertised as a true story. And Blair Witch is kind of the same viral marketing of these kids really disappeared. Here's this creepy thing that happened. Who is the Blair Witch? Big gorilla marketing. The Ring had the same thing. For months on end, they would just show the videotape without any explanation. It would send you to this site, this website, and this website would uh, have a confession of a guy who was supposed to be Chris Cooper, and he's basically pleading with you about his fate, and they would pass out this videotape at concerts and venues and other things with no explanation whatsoever. And my favorite part of this is DreamWorks. Once it was released, they deleted everything and denied having anything <laughs> to do with it. They're like, nope, oh, nope, crazy. nope. Yeah, there was a website that was like written by one of Katie's friends who was unaware of Katie's death. She was talking about being kidnapped or running away. 
scientific research, everything. Were you guys aware? You you mentioned seeing this in your teens. Were you aware of this viral campaign when it was distributed? Yes, I. So I didn't see any of the VHSs, but I remember the idea of it being floated around that the tape was real. And I don't know about you guys. It sounds like Chad, you kind of dove into this a little bit of with doing AIM Instant Message, but. This movie really, even after it came out, totally had a huge impact on the culture for a really long time. I remember that being a thing of who do we want to call? Yes. <laughs> and so just when they pick up, just go seven days and see, <laughs> uh, and see what they would do and how freaked out they would get. And some people would think it was funny. Some people would actually be really scared and uh, to me, it's genius when you can take a movie like this and uh, and really just bring that lore to life and then make it so that everybody is talking about it and participating even after seeing it. Yeah, I was unaware that there was viral marketing around the ring, uh, but uh, I think there were remnants of it that – until you brought it up now, Chad, that I think existed – around sort of this aura of seeing the movie that like had to have been part of my childhood i just i just don't remember it clearly uh, but i i do remember the idea of uh disconnecting uh buddy buddy of mine rishi rishi hope you're listening <laughs> R- R- rishi's tv in his room you could disconnect the cable cord from the wall so you turn the tv on and it's just the static nice oh, gosh. like that's <laughs> that i remember being pervasive in like as a prank uh i never did the call and just say seven days but uh yeah the infamous call but yeah the uh, the the I think the only other thing I can think of virally like that that stood out to me was I actually did purchase a sticker that I could put on my Nissan back in I guess 08 I suppose this was but it was a uh, it was essentially a political sticker that says I believe in Harvey Dent nice uh, as if it was like Harvey Dent's campaign to get elected knowing that people that got the inside joke would get it and people that didn't would be like well what is that you know I love the guerrilla marketing but i i also love what they're doing with the dvds and things like that when you when you purchase this you didn't have a choice so when you boot up the dvd it's the first thing yeah. yeah the videotape is the first thing you see and your cursor disappears you can't do anything about it your remote control is disabled and you can't pause it fast forward it you are stuck and if you turn off your TV, it makes you rewatch the entire thing over again. And so <laughs> when that's over, it returns to the main menu. Then you hear, because these people, these people, I love them because they take this extra step. A phone rings in the background twice oh. after all that's over. Then you get your remote back. So kudos to these people. I... I wish something like this would happen again because this was three years after the Blair Witch and just that type of hype and marketing. I think, Dustin, you may have nailed it of 2008 with The Dark Knight. That's probably the last time I can remember any kind of just marketing campaign of trying to get you to visit a a website. Cloverfield did it a little bit as well, but nothing to this extent. Blair Witch being the absolute masterpiece, although I it, we got to throw a little bit of love to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre for making people believe there was actually a, a leather face killing people and this was a documentary. So, <laughs> right. So kudos to that. I, I know I'm going to keep bringing up a movie that uh, two thirds of us haven't seen, but I will talk a little bit because Dustin, you alluded to it in your plot summary. The ending is changed from Ringu. And the original, I'm not going to spoil it, but we know exactly who our heroine gives the tape to. It is made very, very clear. But in the ring, it was originally planned that Rachel would give the copied tape to an, a murderer. And this murderer's scenes kind of bookended the movie. But it was cut out, and we're left with an ambiguous what happens to the next person that watches this? 
I'll, I'll start with Lizzie. Do you like a vague ending better, or would you be comforted a little knowing they gave it to someone who maybe deserved it? I like the existential crisis of what do we do with the person? Because that would be my thought, right? I, I would never feel okay with with watching it. I remember I've seen the opening scene of Ring 2 where Ryan Merriman, shout out to anyone who's ever seen Smart House, that watched <laughs> um, that uh, where he's trying to show it to a girl and he's kind of capitalizing on the fact that she has a crush on him. And so kind of circling back to the ending to answer your question, I just, it is kind of that huge, big looming question of what do you do? But then I think there's also this kind of underlying, I wouldn't necessarily call it a pun, but kind of this meta idea of we have just watched it. So it's, you know, they could kind of almost look into the screen almost immediately and be like, what are we going to do with the person that we show it to? And then kind of have Aiden and Rachel like look in directly into the camera almost at that point, because we now have watched it. I think that was kind of what played into the, the culture lore of it. But I think overall, I am a fan of leaving that open ended. I think that giving it to it's they give it to the grandfather, correct? And Ringo. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. I guess. So I think that kind of changes the dynamic a little bit because I think it makes it like a sweeter movie about love and sacrifice where this is just kind of more about this evil force that's that's in the world. So I think it makes it a little bit scarier. How dare you try to wrap up this movie with a bow? No way. <laughs> Leave, it. Leave it so that we don't know. That is maybe one of uh, of the several scary things. One of the top three things about this movie is that, uh, like, what I think it ends with the, uh, you know, what, like, who, who do we give it to? Or, like, who, who mm -hmm. do we going to show it to? I, I can't get the quote just right. But that's what's best. Because um, it's a very late realization of what must be done. Now, it does make sense for certain forms of storytelling to have a plan. The plan is we're going to show it to a, a guy on death row. Or we're going to show it to uh, you know, somebody who's a serial murderer. I, I, you know, like that's, that makes sense, and I appreciate that somebody has thought about, well, here's how we come all the way full circle. Mm-mm. <laughs> no, leave it ambiguous. That's that's that taste you want from a movie like this. I kind of want to take a step further, and I really don't want to be this guy on the podcast of I hate children, but I kind of want it to be like stolen from Aiden's backpack, and they watch it at his uh, daycare or something, and he's just, no! What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> I, I want that doom. I just want that... Uh, <laughs> Somehow they lose it and it falls into the wrong hands and it's just accidentally aired. Or we get a Halloween 3 type thing where the silver shamrock counts down and we get to <laughs> all yeah. these kids watching it. It's just a <laughs> I, I like it so much more when it's ambiguous of, well, maybe they're going to do the wrong thing. Maybe they're not not going to give it to a bad person. I've said this before with with other movies and uh, recording too is that I I refuse to watch Ring Two or Rings or any anything else. My my takeaway from this art piece was that this is it, it can open and shut and and now while well it doesn't shut like you know okay we know exactly what happens. The feeling you get from the end of it is, I think, exactly what I would want. And so even, you know, 20 years later, I will not watch Ring 2 or Rings or anything else like that. I, I prefer to keep this feeling that this movie gave me the same as it always was, which is you don't really know. Um, and that's it's such a nice tool to be able to pull out and use uh, for the, to to you know, to to put an end to to this this tale, you know, two hour tale is, who knows? Yeah, the last shots you really get after they say what happens to the person that watches this, so you get a bunch of those very flashed in images from the tape. So yeah, yeah it's absolutely meant to imply, oh, you did. 
So well, and and if if you want to believe that something funny like <laughs> like the tape gets lost, what did you say, Chad? Yeah. That the other kids in Aiden's class find there. the tape. Yeah. If you want to believe that happens, you can. I a hundred percent do. Yeah, you can believe that. Or or if you want to, you know, be like, well, how does the worst of it end? You know, how do you combat the rage? Is is you wrap it up and you you show it to someone that deserves to die? That's a little too neat for me. Yeah. Yeah, and we were talking about the lore, so I, I'm going to geek out just a little bit more because Samara's psychic abilities, they're known as Nensha, which is a form of spirit photography. That's a thing. So that's how she's able to imprint on the original tape all these images. But this tape is really what's driving the ring, a cursed videotape with disturbing images on it. So is using media as a driving force for horror, is that effective for you, Lizzie? Or Because a lot of Japanese horror around this time, it's centered around media. It's centered around the new internet. So we have stuff like Pulse, which it's like, oh, you could hit this mysterious website or, oh, you could hit this mysterious tape when we didn't really know what was all out there on the internet. Yeah, so I... I think when it first came out, I will say the idea is not necessarily with the ring, but as kind of more movies kind of went into that direction where they were using media phones and things of that nature to be scary. It, it felt, it felt kind of like a cop out to me at the time when I was younger, I remember watching, I think it might've been, possibly pulse or in you know fear.com and all of those movies where they kind of try to use technology to to make it scary and at the time I remember feeling like it wasn't enough for me to truly be scared but now that I'm thinking about it in retrospect as an adult I think that it's the world that we live in so it, like Dustin was saying earlier it's it's about the idea of taking something that is so normalized to us normal yeah mundane desensitized to yes and then making it absolutely terrifying and the truth of the matter is this movies that I that it felt like a cop out to me that tr- you know at, at the risk of saying it they just weren't really done that well I think when the ring is a perfect example of how you can take how you can take modern day technology and truly make it really scary if it's mixed with the right lore and the right story and um, you know the perfect little angry girl. <laughs> perfect little <laughs> angry girl, excellent. Little angry girl. Yeah. Isn't it nice that there are rules to the to the like uh, what you said, Lizzie, earlier about like I like when there's lore. Like yes. we know the kind of the rules about this. And everyone in the world knows, like they know the seven days call mm-hmm. is that there, there's certain rules about how this curse must work. And there's things sometimes with like there is there is a, a certain amount of a lack of explanation that sometimes will take away from a movie. But if you know that if you ha- have garlic or a crucifix, you know, let's just say against vampires or, you know, that uh, a boiled egg and an alcoholic beverage for, you know, Santa Marta, certain demons, like if you know the some of the rules, it, it really adds to like the uh, how real it can feel. And the VHS tape, I was just thinking to myself, what's another little nuance you could do with this movie? Like, well, it's not if you watch it. If you it's if you watch it and you don't rewind it. Yeah. Well, right? Um, you are not kind. Yeah, you yeah. were not kind. You did not rewind. Which, for the record, I still use the term. I think I feel like this word should never go away. Of rewinding a tape. Or yeah. re- rewinding, even though, you know, we're all using digital stuff nowadays. Yeah, and, and they even address, it's like they could predict the criticism of oh well i just wouldn't answer my phone well samara will leave you a message it will leave you a message yeah <laughs> she she is a courteous on rio she... <laughs> hi i'm so sorry that i missed you uh you seven days <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> we're calling about your car's extended warranty in seven <laughs> days yeah. oh my god this is the worst <laughs> They know where no, this is coming. Great. I I think of Scream, like Scream, that movie has a little bit of different impact because we're like, yeah, we're going to check caller ID. But at the time, that really wasn't a thing. But the increased subscriptions for caller ID uh, went up through the roof after Scream. 
and then Scream 2, the first first time they get a phone call, the girl goes, I star 69 you, <laughs> which right. is no longer a thing. But uh, I don't know. It might be a thing, but no one does it. But, yeah, they, they have to continually update and address that. Well, now we live in a world where the actual terror is if someone does call you. Right. As opposed to texting. And they leave a message. Right. This movie, we almost got a lot of alternate casting, which I think is always fun. Uh, Rachel was offered to a lot of different people. First and foremost, it was Jennifer Conley, who actually does go on to do a Japanese horror remake of Dark Water. It was not good. Uh, then it was offered to Jennifer Love Hewitt, and I'm glad she did not do this. Gwyneth Paltrow was offered, Kate Beckinsale, and finally it goes to Naomi Watts. Uh, so a lot of different leads for Rachel. The director did not want a known entity. It seems like with these these potential castings, they were going the opposite direction. But Naomi Watts, we think of her as a bigger actress now. She was pretty new on the scene for this role. So this was this was something she's been retroactively praised for, but she was not Oscar-nominated actress or anything. And DeVay Chase, who took on the role of Samara, she lost another horror role to Kristen Stewart. Panic Room, maybe? Yes, thank you. Panic yes, Panic, Panic Room. room. Mm-hmm. Yes, I remember she was young. She would have been young then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And... David Lynch was offered this movie to direct, but he turned it down. And there are some people out there that are going to be very, very sad. And then there's me that's doing a little happy dance because I don't like David Lynch. I don't need a three hour makes no sense movie. Naomi Watts, when you first saw this movie, were you guys familiar with her at all? It seems like she was a newer actress. And would it have hit differently if, say, Jennifer Love Hewitt, she was bigger in I Know What You Did Last Summer, we had seen her in that. Would it have hit differently if you had seen her in that role? I think it's specifically that I had never seen her before that had a lasting impression. Uh, this is like she this version of Naomi Watts kind of became my like ideal form of her. Like this is what I go to <laughs> when I think of her. And I you know it's not like I've seen a ton with her anyway, but uh, it this this became like I realize that over the last five to seven years, there are the influx of actors, whether it's from just our our huge amount of like Netflix and and streaming shows, but also just young actors who I truly don't know. Like I used to consider myself like a movie trivia guy, but I just don't know these new people. And I realize that like they're getting younger and younger, but there was a time when, you know, Jennifer Love Hewitt, like this was her first thing. And so for me, this was like Naomi Watts' first thing that that I saw, and it 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 set such a high bar for like, oh, I can now consider you as like a top tier. Like this performance is something that you'll have to top for me from now on, because I like the movie so much. And it, it, that's not a, a complete, you know, one to one with her acting performance, but I had no other like habits or expectations of who she was before before seeing this movie so uh it's considering it was a decision to not bring a known commodity in bring someone in that we, we don't have any expectations for really it, it had its intended effect on me as an audience member i loved it i think it really helped with the whole gorilla style too i think that if you had brought in somebody that was super well known it would have taken away from the is it real is it not real because we would just know inherently that it that it's obviously not having somebody that was so well known so i think i loved that but then as far as naomi watts herself i think she's spectacular she's got some amazing screams in this movie that i think definitely categorizes her as a scream queen i mean she does a great job in this movie yeah when she loses it just screaming what do you want from me (laughs) that is fantastic yeah uh, you were talking about no names brian cox he was billed very very high he was featured pretty prominently in the billing he gets four minutes in this movie and uh yeah he really did he he passed up another horror movie to do this one but i think you're both correct as far 
as far as my horror movies, I want to be introduced to someone. I'm fine with them going on to being a bigger and better thing. Samara Weaving is one that I love just about everything she's in, but I was introduced to her in The Babysitter, which is a fantastic horror movie, and I I don't want to know them ahead of time. I I just... I want to immerse myself in the movie and just say, okay, this is someone it could actually happen to them. Scream's a little different. I do love Scream, and Nev Campbell was a known entity. That's just a whole bunch of known entities and people that look vaguely like Johnny Depp. So, sorry, Scoot <laughs> Ulrich. Ulrich. But yeah, that's uh, I, I definitely agree with our director, who has the best horror movie name of all time. His name is... Gore Verbinski. So oh, he, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, he he is known for the Mexican, The Ring. He does a bunch of Pirates of the Caribbean movies, Weatherman, Rango, Lone Ranger, and A Cure for Wellness. So these are these are his other works. He was heavily involved here. The Ring started out; it was a hundred and thirty minutes long before they started editing it. The U.S. version is 20 minutes longer than the Japanese version. They were really, really concentrated on getting a PG-13 rating, which sounds unusual because I don't feel like that's the direction nowadays. Uh, Samara's murder was a lot more graphic. Uh, Mm -hmm. We had murderous scenes that I mentioned. They were cut from the opening and the beginning or uh, the end. So I, I guess I'll bring that up as far as the editing do you want this movie to be longer and are you okay with the PG 13 rating or do you need a little more gore Lizzie? I don't like gore. I'm going to be totally honest. I, I think that I'm, I mean, I'm all for when it serves the story, but talking about like the effect, not the name of the director, right? (laughs) Yes. 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 I I don't uh, like like looking at Saul to me those are the perfect movies to draw a parallel to gore I think to me those movies are not scary in the least they're absolutely disgusting so for me I don't find that scary at all I think that if you are a truly scary movie in terms of the rating you don't need to use a ton of foul language you don't need to have a lot of really nasty violence I think that some of the scariest scenes in the movie are honestly one of the the scenes that stays with me is when Aiden is just talking to Rachel and they have this epiphany where, you know, he's saying, you know, why did, why did you help her? Why did you Mm. help her? And you're not supposed to help her. Yeah. He's like, you're not supposed to help her. She never sleeps. And to me like that stayed with me in a really big way. And that's like totally, if you look at that on paper, it's totally innocent. So I think when you, really have a good story and you have great actors behind what you've written, it can stand on its own without having to be gross and gratuitous. It stands on its own. And I think we have a lack of, to use your word, gratuitousness because this movie focuses on two children in particular and a, and a bunch of adults. What are we missing? A whole bunch of teens the teens are in the movie for a small amount of time, and, and and yes, it doesn't end well for them. But a lot of these film franchises, I guess I'm talking to the two people who would know the best that I know. You, you have a lot of these that are driven by late teens or early 20s actors. Especially it, it, during this time period, yes. Yes, th- that yes. is what drives most of this stuff. And that normally doesn't mean but that's not a bad thing, but – we can certainly lose gratuitousness when we're not dealing with young hot bods. <laughs> we have uh, like parent teacher meeting, like the first 10 or 15 minutes in the movie, like, Oh, I want to talk to you about Aiden. Like these are adult parent things, not, Oh man, we floated the last keg, right? Like, like, <laughs> yes. like it's, it's very easy to lose some of the lewdness perhaps, or some of the yeah. uh, n- almost necessary gore, and the, the the lather of sweat drenching our our young actors when when you have the story that stands out on its own, it's cool just to be like, no, we don't need to pepper in foul language and TNA. It's right. fine as it is. Yeah. Can I just mention that in that scene with the parent teacher conference, 
watching that as an adult, it is such a power play. The teacher sits down on the chair, like the little children's chairs in the desk. And instead of sitting down and meeting the teacher on eye level, Rachel sits on top of the table and looks down on the teacher. And to me, that was like watching that as an adult. And, you know, she already walks in, you know, kind of all flustered and she's late. And so she's already kind of setting the scene. But to me, that was such a power play. And it's totally (laughs) set the tone for me of Rachel's entire personality. I love, I loved that scene. Yes. Yeah, we do we do see a couple of teens. We get the homage to Ringu, the the two teens in the beginning, Katie and yes, Becca. They're course. they're dressed in Japanese school uniforms, so that's kind of their homage there. We do get Adam Brody, who I don't remember if the OC was a thing at this time, but my wife made me my my <laughs> wife made me watch the OC. I was like, hey, it's that guy from the OC. It's Seth Cohen. <laughs> yeah, Seth Cohen and Ryan was nowhere to be seen. We get Polly Peretz, who goes on to be Abby Shuto in NCIS. So she's showing up as the girlfriend of the dad, which she's not really well liked by Rachel. It's interesting nowadays because I feel like studios are steering into the R and we've got to do... This is completely different than the Blair Witch, which is using a lot of profane language. But honestly, I can write that off. Kids are scared in the woods. They're not going to say, shoot darn shucks. They're no. going to say other things, most yeah. likely. Horse <laughs> feathers. Yes, particularly when they are terrified. But this is a family podcast. So, yeah. That's right. Uh, <laughs> when you lose the map, you're mad. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they they are panicking. And this is a different it's almost like a controlled panic you have a 24 timer counting down to your inevitable death but there's no i mean maybe some language for when the horse goes nuts like that's that scene i don't know why but the unnatural way the horse doesn't just jump over it trips and it clangs off that boat like there's little touches for me of just oh okay the horse is not only terrified of this person that's marked but it'll trip and fall i i love those touches i think there's we kind of brought this up with its editing process going from 130 minutes down to what it turned out to be and one of the reasons why things are cut sometimes is taste and i think there are I, I don't I don't particularly know unless you were really looking to shock like an indie uh, movie development perhaps um, like showing as much of the horse movement in that aspect um, I, I think you have a terrible like Twitter backlash over like they didn't need to show the horse getting hurt or I, I think you know what I'm trying to get at mm-hmm. is the idea that th- there's 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 certain things that if you were really just looking to shock and shock alone, then that's the reason that you have something like uh, an animal's neck being snapped or something. But in in, in this movie, which uh, is genre defining the best of its of its kind, um, like the the things that unsettle you are purposefully left in, and I'm glad they are. Uh, it would have been to not have, and because obviously you know the horse in the water with the blood afterwards is part of the video like to not have some of this stuff um i i I rarely advocate for the movie being longer i think that's maybe my most consistent thing give me something (laughs) tight in 90 minutes but uh, i i love the length of this movie they do cut away from every single kill you don't see the result you see katie's face for a brief brief second it's like 10 frames and and that's it of i saw her face and you get this this beautiful shot and that's when everyone screamed but for the most part they're pulling away they go to the next scene before samara does her job so you're you're not seeing how it's happening you're seeing the static so we're left with a little bit of a mystery there Uh, i will i will ask you guys because they did little things throughout this movie for the cinematography did you notice kind of a theme or a motif through the ring that they were doing. And this this is exclusive to the U.S. They didn't do it as much in the Japanese uh, version, but was there a symbol or anything that kept coming up? I'll, I'll lead the question. Yeah, I think, well, I remember reading before I watched it for the second time that everything was 
filmed with a green filter. I'm not sure if I'm using the right jargon, yeah. but it give it kind of that creepy off feeling of being almost sickly. And I, you notice that a lot when you watch, watch it with that in mind. But to me, the, the picture that keeps coming back is how they keep trying to show in real time things from Rachel's POV that late, that you previously had seen in Samara's video. And I actually really loved that, how, you know, I noticed it when I was 14 with the ladder Mm -hmm. because they put, they shove that one right in your face. You know, they do the, the kind of back. Right when she walks under it. Yeah. Yes. And they (laughs) reference the video right in that moment. So you can't, you can't deny that. But then of course with the tree being on fire and like you were saying earlier with the horses, it's fun. It's interesting to me how they're trying to piece together the actual video itself in real time from Rachel's perspective. Yeah. That filter is a great pickup because it was, it was supposed to make you feel a little bit queasy and it's just an unnatural light. They also made sure that none of the characters have a shadow. So again, you're you're put in this world. I think of it follows where they deliberately mess with your perception. Something's not right. You don't know what time frame it is, and it follows here. Things aren't natural. Uh, Dustin, you you pick up on any imagery or symbolism in this? I guess what I what I wanted to say about the the ring about like the the. The ring itself, when you see it, is supposed to be some Samara's view from in the well and the cover going on top. Mm-hmm. And I think it was cool when you first watch it to be like, oh, that's what that is. But I think overall, and maybe it's because I already know that I like the movie, but I think overall I don't need like a, a lot of the mystery solved. We get the big part that matters. Like I don't, I don't think I need to 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 see every image from the video because there are several that are not uh, like in the end brought up, like the giant centipede. I don't think, mm-hmm. um, you know, like or the uh, I don't remember in particular an empty box of or a lidless box full of fingers. I don't remember that. Yeah, or the maggots and yeah. or the maggots that turn into like hundreds and hundreds yeah. of people in water. Um, these things are kind of just gross and it's okay that like sometimes it's it's tastefully gross for the gross that we need to show you um but i I, the images that come across must be purposeful and truly do have an impact because i would say i know this is giving something away when i looked on youtube i did a little search that said like the ring video i wanted to see if there was a nice little clip of just the video and it came up under like my search history like yeah you've already watched this <laughs> like, you've looked up <laughs> just watched the ring video before it's likely that for a halloween party i just like had it on a projector on the wall nice ah that's a good idea <laughs> yeah yeah curse everyone at the party good job. yeah that's right <laughs> gotcha yeah. All you need to do is like stick in your USB drive and, and like share it with somebody at work, and uh, your curse is broken, bro. Yeah, yeah. Streaming yeah. now, everybody is screwed with uh, as far as as far as the curse video goes. Yeah. yeah, we have to think: Does the ghost have Santa Claus powers to get everyone in the world? Because if we all see the movie, I mean, it's going to be a busy day for her. I just p- picture her <laughs> as an influencer. I'm about to show you a video, but before I do, make sure and smash that like button, <laughs> subscribe, <laughs> rate, share. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. This is uh, this is the worst version of Samara. But what I was going for is so the U.S. Uh, version they are really focusing on the ri- ring itself motif. Dustin, you you hit it a little bit where they explain, okay, the ring is actually what she's seen. Yeah. So the the original novel that this was based off of, where the lead was actually male, they gender swapped everything for both the Japanese and the U.S. version. The novelist, uh, his last name is Suzuki, he said, hey, the ring is the cyclical na- nature of the curse. But here in the U.S., we're like, huh, the ring, we're going we're gonna to keep doing that. So 
there's constant images of circles in this movie. The doctor's sweater has circles all over it. We get weird shots of shower drains. And you're like, why are they doing that? But they're trying to show that loop again. Rachel's apartment number has zeros in it. So they, they keep flashing that imagery. Even the Paramount, they flash it very quickly of uh, the shot of the ring. So we, we keep doing that, I, I, I guess, because here in the U.S. we are far less subtle. And we're just like, oh, right. we're calling the movie The Ring. Here you but, go. Put Tyler Durden right next to the copier machine. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yep. And this this was set. It was originally supposed to take place in Massachusetts and Maine, but they wind up moving it to Seattle. Uh, Moeska Island Lighthouse, that's a fake name for a real lighthouse. It's actually in Newport, Oregon, called the Yakina Head Lighthouse. The fun thing about the Yakina Head it's haunted so there it is haunted by a past keeper so we are shooting a real life horror movie in a haunted lighthouse and i kind of want more of that uh, there are a couple homages again not just to the uniforms for ringu but we find japanese writing in anna morgan's things there's a lot of little subtle nods tons of easter eggs that basically say hey we're, we're copying this other movie. We're borrowing heavily from it. I want to ask you something real quick. I want to ask you both something real quick. A haunted lighthouse. A haunted lighthouse where where they're shooting a horror movie. We are doing a movie. We're, we're doing this podcast over a cursed videotape. And the idea that like the mundane can be scarier than the written out scary horror. I mentioned earlier that, like, I'd be the one doing the dare. I'd be the one drawing the pentagram. I'd be the one doing the scary thing because uh, I, I liked feeling that way, and everyone needs someone to just, like, jump. I, so I pose to you two, if that's a haunted lighthouse, you know it's haunted. Not that there's legends, not that there are tales or that some people think it's haunted. You know it's haunted. You going in there? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hold on, hold on. Never mind. Let me change my answer. Let me change my answer. I listened to an amazing podcast. I won't get into too many details of it. It's not a movie podcast, but it's this podcast about this woman who had, like, was absolutely convinced that there was a demon in her car. And she, like, absolutely convinced. She called into this hotline and she was like, but it's okay. It's okay, because, like, I'm a Christian, so, like, every single day I just get into my car and I say I rebuke you in the name of Christ, and then I just go to work, and it'd be fine. And she just was, like, totally cool with it. Um, shout out to my friend Leah, who showed it to me. But I thought I, you were to say um, shout out to my friend Leah, who is the person I'm talking no, about. No, no, but she, <laughs> but she actually sent it to me, because she was like, maybe, she's like, this reminds me of you, because I love being scared, but if it has like, but if it's too real, like I am out. But if I was for like, this is your job. It's like, Lizzie, it's this or your, or bust. Like you're going to be fired. I'd probably have to, you know, maybe get someone to like bless it or something before I would go in. But I am yeah. not like, I'm way too chicken to just like go on in and take the risk. That is a far more interesting version of driving Miss Daisy. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> drive. <laughs> She was like, it's no big deal, just my car demon, it's fine. Right? Um, but yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no. Under normal circumstances, if we were just like friends going into a lighthouse and you told me this story, I'd be like, absolutely not. There's no way. So Dustin, with, without people like you, I feel like most of these horror movies wouldn't happen. So God bless you. Because someone needs to bring out the Ouija board in the haunted house. Someone needs to draw the pentagram. Someone needs to play with the haunted cube and solve sure. the puzzle box. And that apparently is you. Uh, <laughs> I'll without, be right back. <laughs> with, without you, we don't get any of these movies. Uh, That's right. That being said, would I do it? Yes, because I am very, very dumb. Um, <laughs> I, Knowing it's haunted, I would still go there. I There's a famous haunted prison in West Virginia, Moundsville State Prison. That's where I'm from. I'm not... Yeah, I get bored when they do Halloween nights and it's a bunch of in, like 
they used to stick gorillas in the cage or something just to scare you. I'm like, no, no, bro, I want the midnight tour when everything else, when all the actors are gone and I want to camp out there. I want the grave encounters type experience. I want mm-hmm. the cold spots. I want the unexplained noises. I want all of that. So, yeah, I I will voluntarily sleep at this place. I will give me that. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the deed to the house is yours. All you need to do is stay the night and yes. survive. What could possibly go wrong, 13 Ghosts? You guys film, yeah, you guys film yourselves doing it, and I will happily watch it, but I will not participate. And you will be not making it to the eighth day after you watch that movie. That's right, that's right. Yeah, I don't want to invite the juju in, but I will absolutely watch it for sure. Nobody wants to invite the juju in. It sounds like you do. It sounds like you want the juju in. Except except for for (laughs) D-Dog. Yeah, yeah. I assume, Dustin, that you were first in line to camp out at this haunted lighthouse. I love haunted places. Mm -hmm. I eat up the lore. I eat up legends and tales. A huge fan in several contexts. I I will say, and I, I actually prefer scary stories to scary movies. Yeah. Uh, Now we, I, I don't, I don't, I don't guest host on a scary story podcast. I guess just on a movie podcast. But, um, you know, when, when the story comes together just so, uh, it, it's it's absolutely wonderful. And so it, it, even just the story of, yeah, we camped out, and here are these three things I remember from that night. We don't have enough time, but uh, you say you have a friend that has a – no, sorry. You have a friend that recommended you a podcast about a woman who was convinced there's a demon in her car. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I have a I have a roommate who no longer lives with me. had a had a roommate who brought a demon home on accident. But we don't have enough time in this podcast for me to tell you that oh story. Tune in next week, folks. Yep. Yeah, I've got a friend that has been on an exorcism. Like not go. He he went as the kind of apprentice role, like the Damien Karras. Yes. Yes. Uh, of yeah with a professional exorcist and he's like chad that stuff is wild and he wasn't talking about the the ritual he was talking about the results so i am (laughs) i am interested in all of that but yeah uh rabbit hole we've talked about some of the special effects but i will mention the other one because it's it's really fun so the japanese maple that's shown that's the burning tree and fun fact here the japanese maple its fruit is called samara so that's how we get Samara Morgan for this movie. That's cool. But it's, artif- oh, nice. it's artificial. It's built out of steel tubing and plaster, and it's painted silk for its leaves. And they called it Lucille after Lucille Ball, Flaming Red nah. Blue. <laughs> but it kept getting blown down. Every time they tried to film, oh, no. <laughs> they were getting like 60 mile per hour winds, just these gale force winds. And it took uh, four attempts, and it got blown down every time. Reminder, they're filming at a cursed lighthouse. So... There's there's some kind of activity going on here that they do not want this unnatural tree on this haunted ground. I love it. I love it. Oh, that's even better. It, tell me that there's a there's like a scary tale about the production of this movie. The tree won't stay up. Yeah. <laughs> makes, makes it even better. She's inherently clumsy. They really should have named it after somebody else if they didn't want it to continuously <laughs> fall over. <laughs> Yeah, when I when I think of Lucille Ball, I think I think of her uh, trying to stuff a bunch of chocolates in her mouth. Yes, or yeah, salt some grapes. She's and... the the epitome of, uh, or excuse me, the antithesis of Grace. So yes. she not not a good name for a tree. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here for first, guys. Yeah. <laughs> right, <laughs> Lucille is not a good name. I mean, more like Grace Kelly or something like this, something like. Something yeah. that's more stoic. Certainly. Soundtrack, I I gotta be honest, Hans Zimmer does the soundtrack here and he gets a lot more work with Mr. Gore here, but I didn't find the soundtrack invasive. I didn't really find it that pervasive throughout this movie. In fact I appreciated the quiet moments. I felt like the opening was very quiet, there weren't musical cues. So I don't know that I have a lot to say for the Rings soundtrack, but did anything stand out to you, Lizzie, as far as musical cues or memorable music? 
Honestly, no, I would agree with you. I think that, um, and I love Hans Zimmer. I think he does such great work. He's like one of the greats. But I think to me, what I remember most is, as far as sound is, I don't even know how I could recreate this, but like that little, when you're watching the video, there's like this background, like, like yes. sound kind of that's like going on in the background. <laughs> and to me that I could hear that anywhere and I would immediately like the hair on my neck would stand up. So that sound I really associate. And also to me, the movie itself is really quiet. And I can also, when I think about the ring, I also just think naturally of like the sound of the waves. I think that the the movie itself really, uh, the quietness really lended itself to the creepiness of the movie, I think. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. They do have a lot of good sound engineering scenes, if not the music. Dustin, anything stand out to you? It's three for three. That It's it's cool when an absence of something is a positive, is a net gain. I've never thought of this movie in terms of its music. I've thought of this movie in terms of its sound. And there are certain sounds. I think the sound for me that's similar to what Lizzie just described is the sound of a record spinning on a record player without music spinning. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yes. In a way, it's... It's like a creepy ASMR, an ASMR that's meant to scare you instead of relax you. And there's <laughs> yeah. things about the video that do that. Um, there's things about because the movie is quiet. The, 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 movie, the movie also seems cold, even though it's not winter time. But there's something about like uh, you can hear breath more easily without a score behind you. So um, if, for me, the, the score, uh, if its job was to be understated, it succeeded perfectly. So are you guys ready to hand out some awards? I am. Let's go. Thank you for your enthusiasm, Dustin. <laughs> Lizzie, who is your MVP of The Ring? Okay, so my MVP is Aiden. But I think to build on that, I think he dropped the ball. He was the most, <laughs> valuable, he was the, he was the most valuable player in this movie. But he can he horribly epically failed at his responsibility he's not babadook kid level bad but yeah certainly just yes. a heads up <laughs> heads up don't help the evil spirit uh dustin who's your mvp I'm gonna go with uh gore verbinski I, I i was going to actually toss this to naomi watts because uh, it was my first foray into watching her as a performer, and I think seeing an adult in a scary situation, that might have been the first time I ever saw that. But I already covered that earlier. So I, I think in totality for the kind of impact that this has had on Hollywood cinema, though it's a remake, like it's it's um, unmatched. So I'm, I'm going to give the credit to, to Gore, the man, not the concept. That is an excellent pick. I went with uh, Hiroshi Takahashi. He's the one that wrote the original screenplay for Ringu. And I think if if it's not there, like this is the template. He, he had the template for this movie to su succeed. I think the U.S. version is better. I do think it's one of those... If you Whichever one you see first is probably going to be what you prefer. But I like that the makeup's a little better in the U.S. version. Uh, I do like the kid better in the Japanese version. I like the ending of the U.S. version better. So, But I've got to give credit to the source material here, so Hiroshi Takahashi for putting this to screenplay. Lizzie, Best Supporting Actor. Best Supporting Actor for me was Brian Cox, who play, plays Richard Morgan. I loved him i thought to me he was the perfect red herring because up until really towards the very end of the movie the only really clue that you have that samara is bad is the footage that you see of her in the hospital but up until then you really don't know whether or not she is evil or if she's just this sad misunderstood little girl and they really try to play it off pretty big. Like Brian Cox has some kind of wicked involvement. And I remember watching it for the first time and they even lead you down that in a quite a literal way where Rachel herself believes it. So I think uh, Brian Cox did such a great job of kind of continuing, uh, continuing, excuse me, the story. 
and uh, being a perfect red herring. Yeah, that is kind of the anchor man that escalated quickly scenario of, mm. okay, <laughs> now he's panicking. Oh, now we're in the bathroom. Oh, toaster. And yep, yep. <laughs> well, there he goes. Like, he made sure. Dustin, who's your best supporting? Well, it's Brian Cox, so we're uh, aligned there. Yeah. And I think I think uh, Lizzie said it better than what I could say, but I, I think what I just want to add is that there is a certain despair that Brian Cox uh, shows us on screen mm, before what we know is going to happen. I don't think Rachel as a character is – I never thought that she would do anything to try to stop him, really. Um, <laughs> and so, so seeing him – intent on doing it uh is something that like even now as i speak about it <clears throat> kind of like puts a lump in my throat that's i think i think suicide as far as taste we were talking about things on the editing room floor su- suicide something i have an issue with in movies sometimes i think that and alcoholism are often used as tools when there should be far more development or explanation to them um but this is one of those where i think they really did it right and Brian Cox shows you the level of pain he's under without really much explanation. Like you said, four minutes on screen. So uh, I could, I could talk more, but that's just cause I like Brian Cox. So uh, yes. I'll submit that. Yeah. He's amazing. Yeah. Well, he says it perfectly. He's like, it, this will never stop. You being here proves that, you know, he, he, it's perfect line to explain everything. Yeah. That's fantastic in mind, too. I love Brian Cox from yes. Super Troopers, Trick or Treat, The Ring, you know, all, all of it. King I, Agamemnon. Yes, I, I love Troy. I will defend that to the death. I I will not back off that hill. It's a good movie. It's a bad movie, but I love it. So, yep, Brian Cox for me. Hidden Gem, Lizzie. My hidden gem was Anna Morgan. I really... I wish, and I'll I'll go into this maybe a little bit later on with the more superlatives. But I I watched this movie with a different lens as a mother. Mm. I when I watched this as a 14 year old, you, you don't think about it. You're just it's just something sad that happens. But as a mom, you know I have three children, and so I understand what it feels like to desperately want a child. And I I thankfully don't suffer from the things that Anna suffered from, but I understand being so excited and thrilled about something so incredibly precious. And so I can't imagine what must have happened in her mind to go from that place. Cause they really drive it home how badly she wanted a child and how thrilled she was to have Samara. And then to know then this place of madness that she was in, I wish that they would have, dove into that a little bit more I think watching that descent into madness would have been um absolutely petrifying to watch like kind of I know that's a little like Babadook style horror a little (laughs) bit but um but it uh but it certainly would have been entertaining and very um very shaking to watch to my core but I think I think Anna Morgan was fantastic she only I think had the one line, you know, that all I ever wanted was you, but she mm. leaves a huge impression of a mom who just so desperately wanted a child and her world getting turned upside down in the worst way possible. Yeah. That's Shannon Cochran was who played Anna Morgan. And she was my pick too. Not just, not just for that role, but I think she nails creepy. There's something about her that's Maybe it's just the sharp facial lines, but she nails creepy and she gets this not quite right vibe. So I, from the first time I saw her, I did not trust her. And hearing that tragic <laughs> backstory, that's important. I, you need yeah. you need those characters where you're like, oh, you're going to do something that I'm not going to like or appreciate. So, yeah, she's mine, too. Dustin, how about you for Hidden Gems? Um, I went with Becca, the other teen girl, not Katie, but yes. the the one who survives. And is uh, institutionalized, yes. And yeah. I'm specifically targeting her institutionalized acting. And credit has to go to makeup here as well 
for showing what someone in those conditions would look like and uh, credit to her for talking like how someone in those conditions, especially going through what she went through, went through and uh, communicates. So I, I think that was a stellar small amount of time, um, but it was it was pretty cool because um, she she also adds to the drive, the unrelenting drive of Samara um, a little bit, even without knowing the full picture. Like uh, you'll know. We'll yeah. see. She knows what's up. She's like, you've got four days left. So, yeah. She's... She'll show you. Oh, yes. Yeah. Recasting. We're going to recast a, a member of this cast. Lizzie, who are you suggesting? Um, okay, so don't get mad at me, Dustin, but I would recast that guy. <laughs> no! <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I actually think... Uh, I think that scene is confusing for me. I do. I appreciate. I appreciate the need to have somebody that can create an extra creepy element. But to me, I think in terms of the story, it only just gave me more questions of like, yeah. were you? Uh, so well, Adam me, Brody's it, not going to do it for you. you know? Right. I mean, <laughs> Becca, didn't, Becca didn't need to be there in the first place. They could have rewritten the whole first part to just be Amber Tamblyn's character with her being on the phone with her mom or however they wanted to do it. But I think um, that whole scene, even though it is super creepy, I it just left me with more questions than anything else. And I found myself getting distracted. So no recast, just complete elimination of a character. I don't think we right. had that. Totally right? gone. Yeah. Wow. Just delete. Yeah, just replace her with yeah. a ghost. Right. So not on screen. All right. <laughs> Dustin, are you deleting someone? Yeah. Who was her? Uh, who was Lizzie's best supporting? <laughs> no, Brian, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Brian Cox. No, I'm, or no Anna I'm Morgan. Kidding, actually, um, so I, I I thought we might all go after uh, Noah because oh, that's I who I did, and I think the thing like I, I I don't think I've seen him in anything else, but I I will say uh, I would have liked some something about the dad to be reflected in. Aiden a bit because Aiden is kind of a little Alfred E. Newman looking cartoon mm, yeah. creepy but he's odd looking uh, so I was thinking what if you had an, a similarly like odd looking handsome like what what's the what's the number one odd looking handsome Kylo Ren who's that dude oh Adam Sutherland. Adam Driver yes, he's Adam one of those Driver, guys yeah. like, you're not sure if he's like below poverty or extremely hot like you don't know <laughs> So like, so what I was thinking was yeah. at the time though what would work for that would be like Killian Murphy I think, mm, um, okay, kind of a, an odd handsomeness. But literally that's the only reason why. Uh, I, I still liked the performance of whoever Noah actually is. I don't feel like Cillian Murphy is odd handsome. Like I I went to Letterbox because I recently watched Red Eye, and the amount of women and some men that we're talking about. Hey, if Cillian Murphy wants to choke me in a bathroom, sign me up. <laughs> like that was ninety percent of the comments there. Yeah. So. yeah. I think he's objectively handsome. I think you know what it is. It's his voice. It's a, it's not so much his um his face. It's it's the way he talks. There's something about his voice that's very calming. That I I I can't speak to wanting to be choked in a bathroom. Count me out for that. Sure. But I think that um. <laughs> Yeah. But <laughs> we're, we're not yeah. kink shaming here. But, but uh, I would, but I would say that I think I think he's pretty objectively handsome. But I like the Adam Driver though. I I, yeah. I feel what you say about him that there's something about him that's off. Yet I find myself liking the way he looks at the same time. Fair enough. Fair enough. Unsurprisingly, I went after the child actor, so I I, <laughs> I want to tone down the creepy. Uh, again, the Japanese version, he's not creepy and sort of annoying and so david dorfman i'm going after you i kind of want to replace him with like a robert pattinson or a daniel radcliffe so <laughs> younger kids that they're just more normal there's something about aiden that's off and i don't trust and i feel like i need to trust the kid and david dorfman does not lead to a level of trust there's a lot of people whose faces i just don't trust i see that kid and i'm like you're <laughs> You're unreliable. I I agree with you. Well, he was unreliable. He yes. led his he led his mom astray the entire time. And then yeah, he should have like spoke up. 
He dropped when the ball. He, yeah. When she, yeah. yeah. He, he is a failure of a kid, and Daniel Radcliffe is not going <laughs> to let you down. He is. No, absolutely no. not. No, Gryffindors never do. There you go. Avada Kedabra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Exumo Wello, I don't know. Best Something. shot. <laughs> Lizzie. Uh mine was after right after Rachel watches the uh, the tape, not the the cursed tape, but the tape that Richard Morgan steals from the hospital. Mm-hmm. And it's the the whole scene where you're watching Samara admit that she wants to hurt people. And when that move or when that tape finally ends there's this cut where the lighthouse shines a light into the room. And as you do that, you see that Richard Morgan is standing behind her. Yes. And to me, that really creeped me out. And that was what kind of solidified him for like a split second for me as being the bad guy. But I remember that was kind of one of those, woo, like he's right behind her, like something huge is about to happen. And it sure did, just not the way... I anticipated it happening. Right. She is not in danger, but you're meant to think so. Yeah, that's that's a great, great shot. Dustin, what's your best shot? I normally don't go with the like technical shots, but there is a it's in the opening scene. And I, I think it only stands out because there's other things that are wet and water dripping off of places uh, throughout the movie. But the, uh, they have a really close up shot of a doorknob that's wet when Katie goes to open it and like right before she uh, she gets killed. And I thought, like, where? What are we doing? Because that's that's what I thought of the first time I saw it in the theater. Like, what, what, what's? Because there's something overflowing, right? So like, I, I'm I'm just like thrown out of here, and it's not a horror thrown off. It's just like there's a lot of things for me to keep up in the air. So I just thought like that cool shot of the doorknob okay. uh, early was good. Um, because we also see water dripping off of like the the beautiful red leaves later on, so it was almost like setting up water dripping off of things later on throughout the movie. It, it stuck with me for twenty years. That is, that's a good scene with a good shot, and I'm gonna back you up by a couple of frames because mine was there's the low angle shot as Katie is coming up the stairs. You're basically on the floor as she's coming up the stairs. And you see this pooling under the door as she approaches that wet doorknob. And so you're getting her feet. You're not getting anything else. Quentin Tarantino is very happy with the shot. <laughs> but it's it's one of the more technical shots in the movie. But it's also this, this dread of you can see something's wrong. But somehow she still just opens the door. And then we get the TV static and off she goes. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's for me. Best scene. A lot of great scenes. Lizzie, what are you picking? My favorite scene is the scene that kind of stuck with me. I think the it's kind of the scene that I think everybody thinks about when they watch this movie, which is like the very last little bit where she comes out of the television. To me, yes. that is like the ultimate scene of this movie. So I cool. remember yeah, watching the very first time you – because as you said, like, you know, they never actually show any of the, the actual true kill shots and you, you don't actually know what happens on that seventh day. So to finally kind of get that reward is great as a viewer, but when they cut to the well and then all of a sudden she's climbing out of it and this whole time you're just kind of on the edge of your seat, like, Oh, what's she going to do? What's she going to do? And then (laughs) for her to actually climb out of that, I mean, I never, in a million years would have guessed that she was actually going to come out of the television. But to me, that was what took this movie to creepy, to crying in my driveway, Mm -hmm. begging my mom's friend to let me stay the night. I was just like, there's no way. And I don't know about you guys, but uh, you know, like HBO for a while had their intro where it would just get staticky. And then (laughs) for like the (laughs) longest time, like I had a visceral response when that would happen. So, I mean, to this day, like I still have a kind of a knee jerk fear response to TV static. It's such a slow burn for uh, for us to make it nearly the whole movie before we see her crawl out of the television. Yes. Because had they shown us that in the first 15, nothing is special about it. Right. It's yeah, the idea right. that we waited for so long. Oh. Yeah, that that is probably one of the biggest holy crap moments in all of horrors 
okay, she doesn't just come at the TV, she comes out of it. So, Dustin, is that your your best scene, or are you going somewhere else? My best scene is uh, like a it's right it's a right adjacent to what Lizzie said. It's it's a mashup of a lot of other things that had happened. It's essentially the a big reveal at the end with the the combination of like the the question. Well, you don't want to hurt anyone, but I do. And it won't mm. stop. And then you hear the whisper, she never sleeps. And like all the all this stuff happens at once. You also see Noah's affected face from uh, his de- demise uh, for the first time during that like quick. It's like a it's like a short montage. It's like a very short montage. But I I thought it was um it was cool to be sort of shocked with these images that really reveal to you the mystery after. Like a slow burn, so it might seem like a not an obvious answer, but it might seem like an easy answer. But I've I've always liked how some of these creepy lines or small things by themselves when put together, it's greater than the sum of its parts. Yes. It's my best. Yeah, that's great. And Lizzie took mine, but I I'm gonna give honorable mention because there's a scene that makes me go, oh no 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 no, <laughs> and that is that is when Rachel falls down the well. And she, uh, she lands yeah. down there. She gets Samara's arm on her. That whole thing, because they wait. And that's what true masters of horror do. She sloshes around for a little bit. And you know it's coming. But they make you wait. And I appreciate them just doing that. They, Gore understood what he was doing here. So praise to that scene. Praise for just claustrophobia and bad things happening. Yeah. Uh, best wardrobe or makeup moment, Lizzie. So I've mentioned this before, but mine's just going to be of the contortionist being able to make her look so decayed and wet and disgusting. And to me, it just that overall look with the slicked hair in front of her face, it's just iconic. It's something that, like you said, with horror, it's just when I think of some of the most iconic horror moments, you just can't help but think about that little girl coming out of the television looking so disgusting with her hair like that. Mm, yeah. Wet, wet decaying makeup. They, yes. <laughs> yes. They, so gross. they nailed ring Samara and you have to, to get this right. Dustin, what's your best makeup wardrobe moment? Well, we covered the makeup. Uh, so my my wardrobe moment it's it's another thing that's really just stuck with me forever, um, which is Naomi Watts. Uh, Rachel wears a striped polo. Mm-hmm. Yes. And those were in fashion for you know girls, teens, young adults, whatever. Those were in fashion for a very small amount of time, around the same time as like you know like one strapped tanks like th- there were some weird fashion trends around that time and so mm-hmm. she's wearing she's wearing like a stri- i don't even know if it has a white collar or not but then uh like that was just like very like though that's just a simple cl- like piece of clothing and then there's a, at the end she's wearing like a very simple like it's just like shades of brown like an argyle sweater but uh, i i just think that her like understated wardrobe in the movie is cool no oh, that's yeah. Im- important when you can take someone who's very pretty like Naomi Watts and I'm not talking about making her drab or unlikable but really not playing to that strength I I think that's that's Mm -hmm. good because that's not the point of this movie she is not there as eye candy like so many Jennifer Love Hewitt's or something like that yeah it's intentional too because Noah makes a comment he's like you're not much of a dresser (laughs) (laughs) rude (laughs) Yeah, you can see why they split up. But Yeah, right. And mine, it's back to Katie's face. It's 10 frames or so in the closet, but that contorted, just awful, yellowed face. That's the image that I just will never get out of my mind. And the sound that accompanies it, every time I picture the face, I hear that screeching too, which is a very short screech. Is probably one of the only jump scares, but... The makeup and everything that went into that is wonderful. So kudos for making people hideously disfigured. Ch- change one thing. Lizzie, 
are we are we heading back to Aiden territory and his dropping the ball? No, no, I thought about it, but I think what I, I I did talk about this a little bit, but I think what I would change is maybe show a little bit of what Anna was seeing. I would have loved to have seen kind of more of her descent into like complete and total insanity. Mm. Um, Cause one thing that I, I think is interesting and again, kind of going back to my own perspective as a mom, you know, you've got two different sides of the spectrum when it comes to motherhood in the movie, you know, you have Anna who like desperately wants a baby and then it ends up going horribly wrong for her. And then you've got Rachel who they don't actually like come out and say it, but based on the dynamic between her and Noah, you kind of make the assumption that Aiden was not planned and she, you know, they really make sure to drive home the dynamic that Aiden and Rachel have with one another. I mean, for goodness sakes, he calls her Rachel, mm -hmm. you know, and he's picking out her funeral clothes. And like, he's very much kind of this caretaker of her and she has zero maternal instinct. Yeah. She leaves him alone, which is illegal, by the yeah. way. We asked this guy when I watched this with my girlfriends, all of us are moms. We're watching this movie. We're just like, where is, who's watching your child? <laughs> like, who's watching Aiden right now? And like, they have a small scene with the babysitter. But you're like, there's so many other times. That, so yes, yeah, so she has zero maternal instinct. And I think as the movie ends, she's, you know, because she tells Noah, she's like, you know, make sure that you do what you can with the time that you have left to protect Noah. So I think at some point in kind of a very strange odd roundabout way her maternal in instincts kind of get activated throughout this process but it's a nice interesting juxtaposition between the two moms and i would have really liked for them to play more on that by watching anna kind of go from this happy-go-lucky very wonderful horse training mom to be into being somebody that would actually hurt their own child and i think um to me that is maybe a ring prequel perhaps that would be something worth watching more dead horses gotcha that's right, that's right. <laughs> dustin what are you killing off more dead horses sorry i'm thinking of uh silence of the lambs All right. uh okay change one thing well i don't want to change a lot of things about this movie but i think a like, gun to my head I do love legend lore. I do love knowing the story behind things. And this is an extremely localized story that the investigator, Rachel, must kind of uncover for herself. But I suppose if there were some other keeper of lore who knew the power of Onrios or violent spirits that manifest through rage. But that's the only thing I would change is the addition of someone else who knew something. Okay. It's so such you, a small change. You need an older, wiser guy that she encounters that has knowledge of these ancient powers. Something, something like that. It's, I did not ever find myself thinking this movie needs this guy or this movie needs this book, but if I had to change one thing, I think that'd be fun. I do feel like she she made an effort. Like she had some kind of prerequisite knowledge. She's like, okay, angry, vengeful ghost. I'm going to help it and set it spirit free. So she knew to do that. She just happened to get the wrong type of ghost. So yeah, right. you know, she, her, her knowledge actually hurt her in the end. Um, mine mine kind of has to do with Samara's wardrobe. Uh, there are a couple of instances. I'm not sure I'd ever show Samara's face. I think through tangled hair is fine, but it'd be much spookier if you never saw the child. But what particularly bothers me is down at the well when she's lifted up by Rachel and you get this intact mm -hmm. Samara and it makes no sense. I don't want the intact. I would rather have a tattered, decayed Samara yeah. rather than that goofy fade to corpse thing. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I, I that's think, a good, that's a good answer. Yeah, I agree. That's a good one. Best quote, and why is it seven days, Lizzie? Why is it? <laughs> I think uh, what I thought was an interesting quote is what Brian Cox says, Richard Morgan. He says, what is it with you reporters? You take one person's tragedy and force everyone to experience it. Spread it like sickness. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that he delivered it much more hauntingly than I did just now. But it was a line that I never noticed when I first watched it. But now watching it as an adult, especially kind of, you know, without going into any kind of rant on what's going on in our world in whatever kind of way. But it is so true in, in the sense when you really think about it is uh, – that we're constantly being told about tragedy after tragedy. And in a lot of ways we tend to focus and fixate on it. So it, it kind of stuck with me and resonated in a different way. Excellent. Yeah. Brian Cox is just so capable of delivering those haunting lines. I, I love it. So good. The, the impact he has in four minutes. Dustin, your best quote. Uh, it is a, a testament to the great makeup of the, Kate of Katie's face when she is, I guess we can say literally scared to death, right? Mm -hmm. Rachel's talking to Katie's mom who I, for the life of me, I can't remember her name, but, um, she, she says something like I've talked to three doctors. None of them can explain why a 16 year old's heart suddenly stops. And Rachel responds something, not catty, but something that's like, I don't know, like doesn't go along with it. And uh, what what Katie's mom says is, Rachel, please, I saw her face. And then yeah. whoosh, quick, yeah. boom, you actually get the face again. And the head is too heavy for the shoulders and it like sloops over it, like uh, she, she's cowering in the in the closet. And mm -hmm. the first time you see the face is like you said, Chad, like an audible scream from the audience. But it's that second time it's like, oh, you see it again. Like we weren't ready for it in the middle of this casual scene uh, is uh, was maybe the biggest scare of my young adult life. So like that was it's it's the combo of the quote with like with that new scare that you get. Um, yeah, because there's a lot of cool things that are said in this movie. It's just that that's it's it's that feeling of, oh, there's the face again. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. But I saw her face is definitely memorable for me. For me, it's you weren't supposed to help her. It's just that final yeah. twist of, okay, it, I I think of John Mulaney. That's when the afternoon went from good to great. <laughs> That's when the movie went from good to great. You have now unleashed the angry spirit from its trappings, and God knows what will happen, and God help us all. So... Just I, I criticize the creepy child, but here's where you want him to be creepy. And you weren't supposed to help her is very, very frightening. What was pretty yeah. cool about his delivery of that line was that like he he portrays that this surprised and scared him. Yeah. In, yeah. In, 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 eyes yeah. wide. Like, oh, 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 wait, really? Like you helped her. And oh. yeah, it's uh, very, very scary. The she never sleeps. Yeah. That stays. That'll stay with you, hearing that um, that line for sure. Had Rachel just told him where she was going? <laughs> yeah. If we go outside of the bounds of the movie itself, perhaps the tagline on the movie poster is maybe the best quote. Before you die, you, you see, see the, the ring. ring. Yeah. yeah, that's right. It's very true. Yeah, but just another reason why Aiden drops the ball. <laughs> Come on, Aiden. Fair enough. <laughs> Kids All right. Are. So... I'm expecting good things, but we'll go to our rating and recommendation. Lizzie, where are you at with 2002's The Ring? Zero to five. Okay, well then, like, three and a half, three I'd say. Half. Yeah, three okay. and a half stars. Yeah, I would say um, it's not a perfect movie by any stretch of the imagination. It's really hard to find a completely perfect horror movie when you're looking at it in standards of cinema versus... I mean, horror is just a really hard genre to get it right to five stars. But for me, this is, it's a really fun watch. It's creepy. It's fun. And I honestly think that if you are into horror in any way, shape or form, I mean, this has got to be in your catalog. hundred percent. Yeah. Dustin, zero to five. Where are you landing? I'm going to go one step further and say, you don't have to be into horror for this to be a must in your catalog. Uh, it's storytelling is beyond the horror or scary movie genre, I believe. Uh, but I'm not going to give it a five. I'm going to give it a 4.5 for me. This is very high on my list, uh, very formative of me. I believe I learned 
that I now love scary movies because of how I felt after this movie and this movie alone. Mm. Um, there were other movies that I thought were good. There are classics. In fact, one that we rated as the number one movie that we covered last year. Even still, that movie was a cool horror movie. This was like a transformational movie for me and American horror cinema in general. I don't think we get Paranormal Activity, Insidious, the like these no. these doll movies, these these um these mundane right. movies. I don't think we have them without this. And to say that the Japanese did it first, I mean, what else is new? But uh, it's it scores very high, and uh, it, there's a reason it's on my permanent rotation for. Like, oh, it's that time of year. Let's get creeped out. I'm going to go one higher, and this is five stars for me. I, wow, that's awesome. I love The Ring so, so much. I was so happy to see it picked. And the statement of how important it is to horror, I think it can't be overstated. It opens the door for Asian cinema for us. And I love the story itself. Uh, it freaked me out when I was younger, and I appreciate it still now. So I love it. Great, great short list. Great time. Speaking of movies, because I have no good transition, uh, we are going to talk about a military movie. This is just, I can't transition from horror to military other than war is hell. So we will, we will do a salute to service week next week. Dustin, do you want to help me with a movie? I'm ready. All right, option. Reporting for duty. Very good. Miss the sir. That'll be 20 push-ups, though. Option one is oh, no. The Deer Hunter, 1978, an in-depth examination of the ways in which the Vietnam War impacts and disrupts the lives of several friends in a small steel mill town in Pennsylvania. Option two, The Dirty Dozen from 1967. During World War II, a rebellious U.S. Army major is assigned a dozen convicted murderers to train and lead them into a mass assassination mission of German officers. Or option three, Patton from 1970, the World War II phase of the career of controversial American General George S. Patton. Uh, I am going to be on this episode, and I am pleased to do an older movie, The Dirty Dozen, 1967. Excellent. I have not seen these. I've seen the others, so I'm excited to get to check out The Dirty Dozen. Check that out with us. Lizzie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for suggesting horror. This makes me happy. So It was a great time Yay. talking with you. Yes, thank you guys so much for having me back. Yep. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you, all the lords, ladies, and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable. We invite you to reach out to us. We want to hear from you. Subscribe, rate, review us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcast. Give us a like on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at movie underscore retro or email us at retromovieroundtable at yahoo.com. Producing and providing this podcast is fun but not free, so pay us via Patreon, patreon.com slash retromovieroundtable. We like money. It's appreciated. All this money will help make the show better for you listeners. As always, thank you guys so much for listening. Be good to each other. Watch more movies. Dustin. I sure am glad you told me earthquakes are a myth. Otherwise, I'd be terrified right now.